Welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be back. How many of you guys had a New Year's resolution? Raise your hands. Yeah, me neither, except I'm married. So my wife said, we're going to have resolutions. So if you're married, guys, that means you have a resolution. So she started around the room on New Year's Eve. What's your resolution? What's your resolution? And my wife didn't give us like an opportunity to like pick freely. She said, I want to hear a relational resolution. That's not even fair. It's not even fair. So they go around and it gets to me and I'm like, no, I think I'm good. I know. And my family was like, oh, really? Well, since we're in a cabin and we're all trapped together up in the mountains, let me help you. As they started sharing some areas, they all think I can grow. I was like, I thought it was New Year's resolution, not a New Year's roast. But the reality is, we all need to make resolutions, but we don't want to because we don't want to be real about what we don't want to change. Amen? I don't want it to change. I want 2019 to be just as terrible as 2018, and then I'm going to blame God. You ever ask yourself this question? What's God's resolution for me in 2019? I think he has some. Isn't it amazing? I mean, we all act like we're going to change our lives. No, no, you're going to be just like you were. God is in the business of changing lives. So how many of us need to ask God, God, what do you want me to change in 2019? So here's the sad thing is, I really, in that moment, when it was my turn, it wasn't popcorn, it wasn't random, we went around clockwise. I honestly thought I was good. These words came out of my mouth. Well, if I thought I was doing something relationally wrong, I would change it. I'm not proud of it, I'm your pastor, I'm telling you the truth, that's what came out of my mouth. And then my daughter gets into an accident, crashes my car, not her car, my car. But remember, I'm relationally good. I'm good. There's nothing that needs to change about me in 2019 because 2018, I'm good. Awesome dad. My son calls me dad. We crashed the car, which is hilarious because he wasn't driving. My wife says immediately, stay calm, stay calm. And this is what my wife says. She's going to remember everything you say. <laughs> remember, I'm good. Nothing needs to change in 2019. I'm good. My wife is like, she's like my little guardian angel. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. <laughs> like me blow it. I didn't crash the car. So we get there and I, I this man, this happened. The police officer's there and I want to talk to him. It's not his fault, but we're going to talk. I want to talk to this guy that ran into my daughter. I'm going to talk to him. He says it's not his fault. My daughter sees me, starts bawling. And this is what she told her mom. I wasn't afraid of the cops. <laughs> Apparently, I have some growth to do in 2019. And here's what's so sad. As I call the insurance company, I call other people. Everybody, when I told them that I crashed my car, their first words were... Are you okay? Why didn't I say that? My words were, you did what? You did what? Not were you okay? And I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord. I should not be a leader of people. <laughs> you know, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this. You know, put me in a prison yard. You did what? <laughs> now, I'm not big enough to say that, but that's what I would think. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. What are you blind to in 2018 that God wants to change in 2019? Here's what I learned. I cannot plan my accidents, but I need to start planning my reactions. That's what God taught me. I have no idea what's in store for 2019. I know this. I got to work on how I respond to it. I'm not good at responding when things don't go my way. When they go my way, I'm like Jesus. Oh, thank you. You like my sermon? That's fantastic. Welcome. You are now under my wing of protection, right? But, but when I don't respond, I mean, when I don't see it coming, I don't respond well. I want to talk to you today about 
making room for what God wants to do in your life. Some of you are like me, you're hard-headed, knuckle-headed, and you don't think anything needs to change, and Jesus is shouting everything needs to change. Everything needs to change. So let's pray that God could speak to us today to begin to jackhammer the area of our heart that is closed to the surgery that he wants to perform. Because I'm telling you, somewhere in your life, God needs to work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, for us that you would reveal, God, where we need surgery. Where do we need to grow? What needs to change? God, what do you want to do in our lives? God, if we're, if we're single, what does it look like to be single in 2019 that wasn't in 2018? How can I be different? God, if I'm married, where are the areas of my life in my marriage that I need to turn over to you? What does parenting God look like in 2019 that needs to look differently from 2018? God, my relationships at work, the way I handle my finances, Lord, my health, my fitness. God, what area are you screaming at that I don't want to hear? Lord, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the thing you need to know about Jesus. He never preaches the sermon you want to hear. He always preaches what we need to hear. And that's why they killed him. That's why. Because it's hard to hear. It's hard to hear, even from people that love us, what we need to change. So let's begin in Mark chapter two. This is the second chapter in the gospel of Mark. So that means there's chapter one, bam, the gospel of Mark starts. Here we are, chapter two, and we're already gonna be confronted with how hard-headed people who think they know God are. Here's one of the first mistakes we make as Christians. We assume lost people are the only ones that are lost. That means you've never been to church with your eyes open. As Christians, we can be just as lost, just as hard-headed as anybody else. And the reason the people that killed Jesus killed Jesus is because they thought they were already found. They thought they were already saved. They assumed they were already good and Jesus bothered them. And so they killed him. So when Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Do you know why? 80% of all the miracles that Jesus did were in Capernaum. In Hebrew, it is pronounced Kafir Nahum, the place of healing. Jesus knows where he's supposed to be, the place of healing. In Greek, it's called Capernaum. And oftentimes, things lose their meaning as they transition from one language to another. The other day, Tammy and I were in Loma Linda. She says, what does Loma Linda mean? Probably none of you know. Beautiful hill. I didn't know that. Never would have thought of that. I thought it should have been named Stuck on the Ten. <laughs> I know. I'm going to be here for the rest of the year. <laughs> Just as funny. All right. So sometimes we, we, we lose what things mean as they transition languages. The news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors, there was no more room. There's no more room. There's no room. Jesus is home. People gravitate to him. They're drawn to him. They want to hear him. And so they come to hear him teach and they come to hear him preach. Underline this next line, even outside the door. Even outside the door, there's, there, not only is there not enough room inside, there's not enough room outside. It was so packed with visitors, so packed, there was no more room, even the outside door. It says, while he was preaching God's word, he's preaching God's word, and people are pouring in because they've never heard sermons like this before. And that's how you know when God's speaking. You know it's God speaking when you've never heard it that way before. You're like, whoa, I've heard that story since I was a kid. That's how you know when God's speaking. It's when you start hearing, you start learning. That's how many of you figured out sandals was your place because you came here and you go, oh my gosh, I hear God. I feel God, I experience God. And people start to gather and people start to collect. He was preaching God's word and four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. 
How sad. You show up. You didn't look at your Disney card. You forgot it was a blackout day. Oh, can't get in. Can't see the mouse today. But you've come all this way. You brought your family and your friends. You can't get in. You're not getting in. You can't squeeze in because he's paralyzed and you can't get him through the door. People are packed. Packed. One of the most moving experiences of my life was to sit in the office chair of the late Reverend Billy Graham. I was scheduled to meet him, but he was so sick, he had to cancel. But they let me hang out in his office, so I did. Tammy took a picture of me, feet up. Anyway, so yeah, I was, that was not a good moment. But as we walked around his office, I looked at some of the pictures that he's kept over his life. Now, many of you don't know who he is because if you live long enough, people forget who you are. That's just the reality. He was one of the most famous people, not Christians, people of the 20th century. And I saw photos of him preaching in South Korea to a live audience of 1.3 million people. A live audience, 1.3 million people. He had another picture of him preaching in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, the sworn enemy of the United States of America, they invited Billy Graham to preach and they opened up their largest stadium, but it could only hold 100,000 people. And so families had to make decisions over which family member to send. And Russians went to hear Billy Graham preach with boom boxes on their shoulders, not to play music, but to record the sermon so that their friends and family members at home could hear. Billy Graham would say he was later so moved at the crowds before they ever got to the stadium. He did the unthinkable. He got out of his bulletproof limo and he walked the streets and shook every hand as thousands of people wanted to catch a glimpse of the preacher man who talked about Jesus. That's what happens when God moves. That's what happens. When people began to hear Jesus, he was preaching God's word to them and four men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole in the roof above his head. Do you want to know the key to sandals growth? Never forget it. You want to know the difference between Sandals Church and the Baptist Church you attended as a kid? One word, one word, desperation. Desperation. Churches aren't desperate. I was. Desperation leads to innovation. I learned very quickly that what I was taught in seminary didn't work. And when you don't have a congregation to pay you, you go hungry. And so you have to change and preach a sermon people want to hear so you can lead them to Jesus. Desperation leads to innovation. There's no room in the house. We can't get them in the door. Is there a roof? Yep, let's cut a hole. No one's ever done that before. Who cares? Who cares? They cut a hole in the roof, which is great, unless you own the house. They cut a hole in the roof. They lower him down right at the feet of Jesus. These guys are good. Can you imagine if you missed and got the restroom? Oh, ah. Oh. Wrong room, <laughs> cut another hole. They got it right down in the middle. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now I want you to circle that word sins because in our culture, nobody knows what this word means. Nobody has any idea what this word means. Our culture has no idea what sin is. You see, in the ancient world, people used to believe this. It was impossible to go to heaven. Right? If you're a Viking, you gotta be a mighty warrior, you gotta appease Thor. To go to Valhalla, you have to die in battle with an ax in your hand. That's the only way you're getting there. If you're an Egyptian, you gotta build a pyramid, you gotta live a perfect life, you gotta withstand the judgment of the 42 gods, and maybe you'll get there. That's how the ancient world viewed heaven. The modern world thinks everybody's going to heaven and nobody goes to hell. Matter of fact, many people don't even believe hell exists. 
So nobody knows what sin is anymore. Sin is the offense of your life towards God. That's what it is. Your life and my life is offensive to God because God knows what he made us for. He knows the potential that we have. He knows what we should do. He knows what we're called to do and we don't do it. Sin is an offense to God. And we offend him every day with how we live, what we think, what we do, what we don't do. It's the ways in our life that we've gone wrong. And he says this, my child, your sins are forgiven because in the ancient world, they must have assumed that this young man had done something wrong in order to live a paralyzed life. Kind of like karma, right? What goes around comes around. So this guy's paralyzed because he deserved it. So the assumption is this guy's a sinner because of his current state. So Jesus says, I forgive your sins. You are no longer an offense towards God. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is this saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Why? Because God is the one who's offended. Only God can say when he's no longer offended for what we've done. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? It's easier. Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick your mat and walk? He says, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This is important. Jesus says, I'm going to prove to you that I have the ability to take away your offense towards God. Jesus says, I have the ability to make you right with God. Listen to me very carefully. In our culture, I hear this all the time. Me and God are good. How offensive. How offensive. Who are you to declare that you and God are good? Can you imagine I see you get pulled over, you're getting a ticket. I say, don't worry about it, it's good, I forgive you. Where well, you're like, well, you're not writing me a ticket. Don't worry about it. Me and the police force, we're good. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people dying going to stand before the, the almighty throne of God who thought they were good and they're gonna only find out that they weren't good and he is God. Oop. And their offense has not been forgiven. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. The man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked through the stunned onlookers. I want you to write this in your notes. One man got healed, but the crowd was forever changed. So many of you are praying for the wrong thing. You're saying, God, I need a miracle. I want to challenge you to pray this in 2019. God, let me see you do a work. I don't care whose life it's in. Let me see you do a work. I don't know about you, but if God heals one paralyzed person in our church, I'm celebrating, are you? I mean, are you going to be like, why not me? This is not fair. And yet... When God heals a marriage, you go, why not mine? When God brings back somebody else's prodigal son, you're like, why not mine? God doesn't heal everybody, but he wants to change you. He wants to change you. He wants to change me. And here's the thing, man, when God is moving and people are drawing, God's doing a miracle. You just need to have your eyes open to see it. He grabs his mat and he walks through the stunned onlookers. Why? Paralyzed people don't walk. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. I believe this is God's will for your life in 2019. He wants to show you things you've never seen before. Write this down in your notes. Circle the word if, if, if. If God is moving, people will gather. Let me ask you this question. Why would anyone waste their weekend and come to Sandals if God is not moving? I mean, I'm funny, but I'm not the best. I, I'm just, that hurts, but well, okay, we're both being honest. 
Like, I get, I get super self-conscious when my kids watch stand-up comedy because I think I could do it. <laughs> I think I could do it. Maybe I wouldn't be that good, but I think I could do it. I get super self-conscious. So my, my, my kids were watching Ellen DeGeneres over the break, and I'm like, okay, she's better than me, okay. She's better. She's cuter, funnier, dances better. Right? Listen to me. What am I trying to say? There's, there's better entertainment than me on the weekends. There just is. But if God is moving, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what the songs are. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter if it's snowing. It doesn't matter. People are coming. Right? This weekend it's raining. Oh my gosh, we got 1.35 inches. <laughs> Right? We're the, oh, we're the only state that measures storm watch in millimeters. Everybody else is inches and feet. You know? I got family in Kauai. They got two feet of rain in two hours. We won't get that like in the next 10 years in California. Storm watch. Like in our, our, our weather people get caught lying, don't they? They're sitting in the boat that's sitting on cement. <laughs> People are not coming to church, it's raining. It's dangerous out there. There's a four mile an hour wind with a heavy mist. <laughs> but if God is moving, we could have the big one on Saturday and the church is full on Sunday, if God is moving. If God is moving, right? Because people want to see God move. Even atheists will come if God's moving. What do you think the atheist said down at the local Capernaum pub? He did what? I know that guy. Yeah, he's always hanging out on the mat. He did what? I'm going to listen to the next sermon. If God is moving, people will gather. And here's the thing that breaks my heart. If you call yourself a Christian, you hate the crowds. You hate them. People tell me this all the time. I, 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 I just feel so lost at sandals. Why? God moved. We grew. Can, can you and I, like, I wish you and I, we, if you've been at sandals for a while, I wish we could just talk. You're like, I don't know. Sandals got so big. I know. I know. I used to go places and nobody cared. Now they're like, he's here. He's here. He's here. <laughs> Aisle 17 in the veggies, he's here. <laughs> Do you know how weird it is to go to the grocery store and the, the clerk just stares at you? <laughs> right? To go to be in the mall and people find you and cry? <laughs> Right. Literally, to be at the park, I knew it was you. <laughs> I was running on Victoria Avenue, running, and a white van pulls up beside me. A white van. If you drive a white van, <laughs> do not troll me. <laughs> I'm running, there's a white van, and I'm an idiot. I got no phone. Can't dial 911, so I try to run fast. <laughs> it's a van. <laughs> Pulls over. So we talked. What am I gonna do? I didn't wanna get stabbed. <laughs> I get it, I get it, I get it. But God is moving. He's moving. You know where I was the last month? Attending our nine campuses, crying every week. Every week crying as I'm watching lives change, as I'm watching churches that were unraveling fall apart, one of them in bankruptcy, vibrant and full. Full. I went to our San Bernardino campus on Christmas Eve. It's packed, packed. And we didn't take an offering. The church was in bankruptcy a year and a half ago. We gave an offering. This is what we said. Anyone who has need for any reason, come forward. Come forward. My wife and I sat in the front row crying. 
Who's heard of a church that gives an offering? We do. We do. Because God is moving in San Bernardino and we're not here to take, we're here to give. One time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again and soon his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. It gets uncomfortable when Jesus starts moving. It does. So what do we do? Do we tell people to go away? Jesus said this, when I am lifted up from the earth, he says, I will draw everyone to myself. The wackier this world gets, are you paying attention? The more they're going to draw to Jesus. They're going to pour into Jesus like we have never seen it before. We're going to see a movement of God that makes the Jesus movement look like a stone's throw. We're going to see a movement of God. We're going to see amazing, amazing things because people are lost and they're dying and they're giving up. And they're going to come back to Jesus. Not because of who we are, but because of what he is. But we have to be ready. If God is moving, people will gather and you got to get over yourself. Well, that was my seat. I'm not kidding you. When Tammy and I first surrendered to ministry, my first church, our first weekend in church, we sat in a pew. Some of you don't know what that is. It's like a long bench. We sat in a pew and an old man stared at us and he said, you're in my seat. He wasn't kidding. Like I was waiting for the ba ba. So we just were like, ooh. How on earth is Jesus supposed to draw himself to sandals if we won't move? If it's your seat, we're done. If it's his seat, we're saved. Next, write this down. Distractions in church can be divine encounters with God. Like we all love the story. Oh my gosh, can you imagine how cool that would be if in the middle of Matt's preaching, somebody was lowered from the center of the roof? I think that would be a distraction. I think nobody, none of you would ever listen to another word I said. You'd all be like this. The next time you hear a baby crying, instead of judging that mom, why don't you start praying for her? Do you know how scary it is in our culture to leave your child with anybody? Oh, but it's the church. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. That's been a safe place the last hundred years. They're here. They're here. And some of you, man, you're like, okay, be quiet. Take your kid out. Okay, kill the kid. <laughs> kill the kid. When I was a parent, I taught my children to suffer in church. <laughs> Maybe that distraction is your divine encounter. Hey, welcome to our church. How can I pray for you? How can I help you? One of the weeks when I was visiting one of our campuses, I was on my way out. I'd been at three services on a Sunday morning, three. It was my last service and I was late forever where I was supposed to be and I was hustling out. And on my way out of the service, this little arm just came out and grabbed me by the shoulder. I turned and I looked. It was a young woman, I'm assuming in her mid-twenties. I don't know because it was hard for her to get any words out at all. I was on my way, I was late, I was supposed to be somewhere else and she just stared at me fighting back tears in the middle of the row. I said, do you need to talk? She didn't answer. I said, I'll take that for a yes. And we went into the lobby and I had to wait. She couldn't compose herself. She couldn't get a word out of her mouth. And I said, I got time. We can wait. And finally, these words came out of this poor young woman's mouth. She said, I think my husband's cheating on me. And I'm in church today alone. 
I said, you are in church, but you're not alone. And man, our soul care people were on it. The campus pastor was on it. And I said, whatever we can do for you, whatever holes we have to cut in our roof today, we'll cut them. Because Sandals is all about God, but guess what God is all about? Her. Her. The next time you get bumped, somebody takes your parking space, somebody's sitting in your seat, maybe that distraction is the divine encounter you need to hear from God that day. And you know why I know that? Because nobody came to Peter's mother-in-law's house to see a hole cut in the roof. They came to hear Jesus. But if it hadn't been for the hole in the roof, they would have never heard Jesus. Sometimes those distractions are desperately needed. Write this down. When Jesus has my heart, I will make room for him in his house. Sandals is his house. Do you notice there's no mention of anybody complaining about the hole in the roof? Who's going to fix that? Who's paying for that? Is that coming out of the offering? I want to know. Look, I signed up for small group. I signed up for small group. I pay for the crackers. I'll pay for the cleaning, but I don't pay for a hole in the roof. One of my favorite small group memories of all time when Sandals first started. We had a two-story house. Kids running all over the place. It was not a safe place to be. We were trying to have group out of the corner of my eye. Off the banister, I see a four-year-old peeing. <laughs> His parents are horrified. They're in the pastor's house. Their son is spraying holy water everywhere. <laughs> That four-year-old's like 21 now. He doesn't remember it, but I do. He that sprinkleth holy water has come. He peed on our carpet. Who cares? It's not our carpet. It's his. It's his. Remember what Jesus said? Let the children come unto me. When Jesus has my heart, I'll make room for his house. John 14, 2 says this, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Jesus likes big houses. And it breaks my heart when Christians say this, well, I just like a small church. I don't like a small church and I don't like a big church, but I like a growing church. I like a church that's open to the people who need God, who desperately, desperately need God. Look at Sandals Church. We got to do a couple things. Number one, write this down. We've got to prepare for people who show up. And anybody ever been someplace and it's like they didn't know you were coming? Tammy and I, we rented a cabin for six nights. Six nights we rented a cabin. We had an agreement, a contract. We paid money. They put it up on Airbnb. They announced, we want people to stay in our cabin. Charged us money, we showed up. Six nights, one roll of toilet paper. <laughs> one roll. One trash bag, one. One trash bag. Man, the, 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 the cooking utensils and plates was something. Does anybody remember Easy Bake Ovens? <laughs> I said, like, what is this? My wife made me a pot of coffee. She hands me this cup. If you have to drink cup, the cup of coffee with your pinky up in the air, I'm not drinking that. That's how you just, it's like, what are we, Italian? Give me a real cup. It was a joke. It was a joke. The thermostat didn't work. It was a thousand degrees upstairs and you could leave meat out downstairs. I'm not kidding you. We didn't need a refrigerator. We had bedrooms. My kids are sleeping in their coat and their ski clothes. Dad, what are you going to do? I don't know physics. Can't figure out this thermostat. Whatever happened to the good old thermostats where you just move it? I'm not a computer science major. Just let me move it. Philemon 22. 
One more thing, Paul says, please prepare a guest room for me. Look, if you're here today and you desperately need Jesus, we wanna be here for you. But if you already know Jesus, you need to be here for somebody else. You want God to move in your life? You need to start moving for him for other people's lives. You need to graduate from freshman Christianity and become a sophomore, which means a little more wise and start looking out for people. Some of you have stagnant relationships with God that haven't moved in years and it's because it's all about you. You can read the book of Philemon. It's one chapter, one chapter. And just so you know, you don't want a book written to you in the Bible. Hey, Matt, right? Philemon. Man, the apostle Paul gives him a tongue lashing. And then ends with, and prepare a room for me. It's like your dad's coming over. I'll be there. Are we ready for people if they show up? Are we ready? Are we prepped? Are we ready? Do you know how scary it is to go someplace for the first time? That's why we need greeters. Like, why do we need greeters? You know where to go. We don't need them for you. I don't need a greeter at my house. Here's your restroom. Here's your closet. Now this is just awkward. But if I've never been someplace before, I need somebody to show me where to go because I don't know where to go. I need somebody to help me sign my kids up. I need somebody to show me where to sit, where to park, how to get more involved, how to meet friends, how to connect. The church needs to prepare for people to show up. Here's what breaks my heart. And if you go to Israel with me, I'm gonna show you this. The house where Jesus is preaching is a stone's throw from the synagogue. Do you know what the synagogue is built for? It's built for large gatherings of people. Here's what breaks my heart. Nobody listening thought, why don't we move the Bible study 50 yards to the place that can accommodate so everybody can learn? Do you know why nobody thought about that? Because everybody who had a seat was only about themselves. Hey, Jesus, I got an idea. Why don't we walk eight steps and go to the synagogue that's across the 12 foot street and let everybody come. Do you know why? Because synagogues weren't for everybody. They were just for Jews. And so many of our churches have become just for us. You gotta think like us, look like us, and act like us or you're not getting in. Next, we got a plan to invite people. Jesus replied with this story, a man prepared a great feast. He sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. Underline this, but they all began making excuses. Everybody has an excuse when you invite them to church, amen? One said, I just bought a field, I got inspected. Who buys property without looking at it? Please excuse me. Another one said, I just bought five pairs of oxen. I want to try them out. Who buys a car without test driving it? Right? Right? The next one just said, I just got married, so I can't come for a free meal, married people. If you get invited to a free meal, that's one you don't have to pay for, go. <laughs> His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys, the town, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. What does Jesus mean? Invite the people you've missed. Some of you keep inviting your kids over and over again. Look, God loves them, you love them, but maybe they're not ready to come yet. Let's invite somebody who's ready. Let's invite somebody who's hungry. After the servant had done this, he reported there's still room, room for more. So his master said, go out into the country, to the lanes, behind the hedges, and urge everyone to find, urge everyone you find to come so that the house will be what? Full. I heard two people say it. What? Full. How does God want his house? Full. For none of those I first invited will even get the smallest taste of my banquet. Jesus says this in Matthew 25, 43. I was a stranger and you what? You didn't invite me. Most people won't come to church unless you invite them. Shocker. Next, would you do this? Would you pray for people who do attend? 
Do you know what's happening right now? I'm speaking these words, right? These words. Some of them are funny. Some of them have a point. Some of them have no point. But in the midst of all this, do you know what's happening? I'm talking right here, and God's talking right here. And God is speaking to the gathered church. And here's the thing. God is saying things that I'm not even saying. You know what God has said in this message? There's married people gathered here today and God is saying your marriage is a wreck and you need me. You need my church. God is saying to people, your life's a disaster. You're depressed. You need healing. Jesus is calling people. I, I've given this whole message telling you to be a Christian and in spite of all this, God is speaking, calling people to become a Christian. And what the church needs to do is just for a second realize that the whole sermon is not just about us. It's not just about me. God is speaking. And we as the church need to have reverence for that and know that right now as we speak, God could be saving a precious soul and changing a life. Pray for the people who attend. Paul says this, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon. We were up in the cabin at Big Bear and one of my daughters invited a friend to be with us and she began to share her story. I wasn't ready for her story. I didn't know her well, but she shared her story. One of nine children, different dad for all the kids. Mom's a drug addict. And here I'm looking at this girl who looks put together well, with it, smart, professional, courteous. And her story doesn't match up with how she presents herself and then she shares. She said, I went to church and people gave me a home. People invited me in. She came as a stranger. And people invited her in and changed her life. And now she's in ministry. She was ministry, now she's in ministry. Because somebody noticed her, somebody prayed for her, somebody saw her as a stranger, invited her in. What if right now as I'm speaking, there is a person in this room, and if you're not in this room, your campus, that God is calling you to help change their life in 2019. And do you know how it's gonna start? With a high. Not like this, the Lord has been speaking to me about you. <laughs> that's, that's not how you do it. Hi, my name is Matt. How'd you hear about sandals? I urge you first of all to pray for all people and ask God to what? To help them. I love that verse. And to give thanks for them. You know what I'm most thankful for in 2018? What God has done in our church. And I am so grateful that we are a part of a church that sacrificially cuts holes in our roofs so we can buy a campus and extend to others. As long as we have that attitude, God is with us. And if God is with us, man, there's nothing we can't do. Listen to me for the next three weeks. I'm going to be preaching a life-changing message that's going to challenge people to change their life and follow Jesus. My prayer is that you would come and bring somebody who doesn't know Jesus with you. Three weeks. That means they can tell you no three times. Three times. Find somebody. Bring them. Because God is on the move. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for 2018. Lord, you have delivered us safely, but you have plans for 2019. Plans to prosper us, plans to give us a future and a hope. But Lord, those plans are wrapped up in your will and us living for your purpose. So God, would you reveal to each of us how we are to consider your resolution for us in 2019, Lord, and I'm sure it involves growing your church, serving your church, and building your church. 
We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Encourage us with your strength and fill us with your spirit. We love you, Jesus, and look forward to serving you in 2019. Amen.